Over 27 years ago, Nintendo would launch the N64. And in my opinion, it's one of the most important consoles ever released. Why? Well, simply because if you compare Nintendo hardware to its competition, traditionally, they were never one to focus on having the most powerful hardware. Their focus was always about offering their customers the best gaming experiences and bringing new experiences with each iteration of their popular franchises. But the Nintendo 64's launch would change all that. The hype surrounding the console was out of this world. Nintendo's goal was to give players the very best graphics available on a home console and offer the very first 3D games on Nintendo hardware. And to achieve this, Nintendo would famously partner with Silicon Graphics, a long-term leader in graphics computing who were looking to get into the consumer market by adapting its supercomputing technology to video games and bringing high-end 3D graphics for the very first time to Nintendo hardware. Silicon Graphics workstations were quite popular in Hollywood in the 90s and early 2000s, responsible for special effects in movies such as Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, Toy Story, and The Matrix, just to name a few. And the promise of these 3D visuals coming to a home console for the very first time was a mouth-watering proposition. But did Nintendo actually deliver on their promises, or was it just a bunch of hype and not much more? To answer this, we need to go all the way back to 1993. In August of 1993, Silicon Graphics and Nintendo would announce their partnership to bring the Silicon Graphics technology to Nintendo's new console that would be codenamed Project Reality. We have always said we would only introduce new hardware when it delivers dramatically improved value for our customers. Nintendo's Project Reality dissolves the current limits of video play causing the world to challenge its notion of what a video game can be. It was the 90s and buzzwords were all the rage. Silicon Graphics would label this technology the Reality Immersion Technology. This would essentially combine a 64-bit MIPS CPU, a MIPS coprocessor, and an embedded software layer. This would make up the pieces that would drive Project Reality. It is the first time MIPS RISC technology will be used in the video entertainment industry, providing the power previously only available in high-end PCs and workstations. These high-end SGI workstations had a going price of anywhere between $100,000 to up to $250,000. The rollout for Project Reality would be in arcades in 1994, and available on Nintendo's new console in 1995 for the very low price of $250. And for many people, getting Silicon Graphics hardware in the living room of your house is almost something of dreams. By 1994, the hype levels for Project Reality were off the chain. Silicon Graphics and Nintendo would showcase their hardware at various trade shows. The first would be CES in Las Vegas in 1994. They would show off tech demos that the Project Reality hardware was capable of. Now, there's a little bit of confusion about these tech demos and how they were run, but as far as I know, they were running in real time on SGI Iris Indigo hardware, and the configuration of the hardware was said to be a close approximation to what we would expect to see on Project Reality Final Retail. The Shark tech demo is probably one of the ones that you've already seen, definitely one of the most famous ones, and this one was showing off trilinear MIP mapping in 1994. Now, in 1994, trilinear MIP mapping required significant processing power. The other demo, the City Skyline demo, showed off a panoramic fly-through of a city skyline, and both of these demos for the time were quite jaw-dropping. There was also a lot of hype in magazines who were on board with Project Reality, showing off pre-rendered images of what could be possible on Nintendo's next generation. Picture this on your TV from a 1993 Game Pro showing the possibilities of new hardware. But it wasn't just the magazines. Jim Clark, founder and chairman of Silicon Graphics, famously said the following. Project reality is like putting the combined computing power of hundreds of PCs together. Simply stated, there will be no other video game system like it. Howard Lincoln, then president of Nintendo of America, said our work with Silicon Graphics enables us to actually skip a generation by driving straight through to true 64-bit 3D video entertainment. Nintendo's Project Reality dissolves the current limits of video play, causing the world to challenge its notion of what a video game can be. By the summer of 1994, Nintendo and Silicon Graphics presented their hardware now known as the Nintendo Ultra 64 at CES in Chicago. 
However, the new 64-bit system was only shown to select persons at a private invitational event. Nintendo did indeed deliver on what they said and offered two arcade games in 1994, Cruising USA and Killer Instinct, with Killer Instinct even advertising the home version would be coming exclusively to Ultra 64 hardware in the homes in 1995. However, both Killer Instinct and Cruising USA had little to do with Nintendo Ultra 64 hardware at all. The reality immersion technology was simply not used, and yet Killer Instinct proudly boasted the game would be coming to home consoles the following year. That never happened as we know. Instead, Nintendo and Rare would release Killer Instinct Gold, which was an exclusive title based on Killer Instinct 2. This would include the arcades release characters, combos, 3D pre-rendered environments, but it did not include the full motion video sequences and some voiceovers. And this was due to the cartridge media format that would be the preferred choice over CD-ROM technology. Cruising USA was the other title that was said to be running on Ultra 64 hardware. However, a few months later, Nintendo of America chairman Howard Lincoln admitted that Cruising USA was actually programmed before the MIP CPU console version of the Ultra 64 tools were even available. The cabinet shown at CES was actually running on the Midway V-Unit arcade hardware, which has almost nothing to do with Nintendo Ultra 64 hardware at all. Fans were also quite puzzled that at that very same CES show, Nintendo did indeed show it with silicon graphics technology, but not on the Ultra 64. Instead, a Super NES game, which would be Donkey Kong Country. And while that game for all intents and purposes is an absolute classic that really showed up some amazing pre-rendered visuals, fans wanted more of the Ultra 64, and something was starting to feel off. 1995 would be a tough year for Nintendo, with mostly radio silence. However, the magazine articles would keep coming with hype and promises of tens of millions of polygons on screen, and even Nintendo hand-waving CD technology of its competitors as slow and a waste of money. But it would be these competitors, namely Sony and Sega, who would launch their 3D-based game consoles, the PlayStation and Saturn respectively, and Nintendo all of a sudden was in a very different position. The PlayStation especially launched strong, and it seemed like Nintendo and SGI's promises were fading into thin air. Finally, in November of 1995, Nintendo would show off the Ultra 64 to the public. The first order of business was to announce the name of the hardware had changed from Ultra 64 to just Nintendo 64. Nintendo would show off two playable games, Kirby Bowl 64 and Super Mario 64, and fans were once again excited. Mario 64 especially impressed everyone with its seamless 3D worlds and platforming. However, the hardware would be delayed until its ultimate launch in 1996. This would represent a major milestone for Nintendo and Silicon Graphics. They would keep their promise of bringing the SGI technology to the home, and even below budget at $199. As for the hardware itself, the MIPS VR4300 was clocked at 94MHz and could manage 125 MIPS or millions of instructions per second. The Reality Coprocessor was a system on a chip that combined the Reality Display Processor for its graphical capabilities as well as the Reality Signal Processor and this would be the heart of what made the Nintendo 64 so unique. The graphics processing would feature anti-aliasing, trilinear MIP mapping, Z-buffering, perspective correction, environmental mapping, and even a completely programmable GPU via microcode. Other features included frame buffer effects, level of detail, and even real-time lighting. Many of these features would become the basis of modern 3D and features that are still applied even to this day. The Nintendo 64 ran at a fairly low resolution, however, of just 320 by 240. Now, while there were some games that took advantage of high resolutions, this low resolution coupled with anti-aliasing and trilinear filtering meant that many games would often look blurry or muddy. To add to this, the Nintendo 64 had a big limitation of only a four kilobyte texture cache. This meant that many textures that were used in games were often quite low resolution. Compare that to the high-end Silicon Graphics workstations that were rendering visuals at much larger resolutions, 
You can see why some people were disappointed by the visuals output on the N64. But even with all this, the Nintendo 64 undoubtedly could pull off some stunning visual effects many believed that was simply not possible on the PlayStation or Saturn. And one that comes to mind is the water effect of Wave Race 64. And there are many other instances of impressive visual effects found in Nintendo 64 games. In fact, the Nintendo 64 was simply unmatched by any commercial hardware until around 1998 when the 3D effects Voodoo 2 came out. And incidentally, by 1999, with a fast PC, you could emulate Nintendo 64 games with a 3D FX Voodoo 2. But the games themselves were unique and developed for the hardware in mind, and some of the very best games were made for the Nintendo 64, and for good reason. The hardware was very capable of pulling off some amazing things. The difficulty was developing for that hardware. Many developers would talk about the complexity of the Nintendo 64. However, studios such as Rare, and Factor 5 would extract the very best from the hardware. Silicon Graphics and Nintendo did finally deliver what they promised. We were just spoiled for years of magazine articles and videos and high-res visuals and effects from the team that provided stunning Hollywood-style effects in blockbuster movies. And somehow, we all were led to believe it. But the reality is, other than the arcade hardware, which was clearly not running on Ultra 64 hardware at all, and some absurd promises that were made both by Silicon Graphics and Nintendo, they ultimately delivered what they promised. But that's going to do it for today's episode, guys. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Were you around during the days of the Nintendo 64 and all the hype surrounding it? Let me know your experiences, even if you were a game developer making Nintendo 64 games, or you were just a fan like myself back in those days. I definitely want to hear what you guys have to say. But we're going to leave it here. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye for now.